to the talk house. We're so happy you're back. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for following. Thanks for sharing with your friends. Thanks for giving us Thanks five stars coming. on Spotify and on Apple Podcasts. <laughs> nudge, nudge. <laughs> we love you for it. <laughs> and happy October. Happy spooky season. This month, we're just going to get right into it because on the pod, we are going to be talking to several different people about money, 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 money. Money. And <laughs> it doesn't get old. <laughs> And our first lovely guest that we're speaking to in the series is Chioma, the mindful bookkeeper. We were so happy to be connected with her and speak with her. And she got real, raw, and honest with us very quickly. That's true. Re-raw, you might say. Real and raw. (laughs) I mean, uh, the spookiest of things is money, right, for most people and talking about finances. And it's also often the thing that you sort of like – the skeletons that we have in our closet to stay with our spooky mm. our our own money traumas, our maybe debt, our relationship with our families and money. And Shioma really, I think as a bookkeeper, number one, that's a scary career. <laughs> a lot of people do not want to hire an accountant or bookkeeper because they're afraid of what they're going to find out. But the truth is Like you need to, you need to come out of the closet. You need to like, you know, air all of that out. And in order to see see that it's not actually that scary and it's actually really manageable. And one thing that I love about this interview is that Chioma talks about her own experience with money and how she's working through it herself. And I think a misconception about working with a financial professional is that they are the ultimate expert and they know way more than you and they've always had their shit together and they can't relate to you and they're judging you for maybe having your shit less together. And I think in this case, you're going to feel so at home and understood by Chioma and her perspective. And for me, that makes me trust her even more as a bookkeeper and accountant. I'm like, okay, you got it. Like, and you don't think that I'm nuts. No, you can feel that she works in a very intuitive way with people just because how immediately relatable she was and vulnerable with her story. And she really opens up about the fact that she was working in this field, but not actually living that financially secure life for a long time. And she kind of walks us through what that was like and how she overcame that. And I'm just really excited for you guys to hear it. So without further ado, here's Chioma. Chioma, it's so nice to be talking to you. And we start with a transparency question on this podcast. You can pick whichever question you would like to answer. The first question is, how many friends do you have? Or the second question is, how much money do you have? Oh, wow. We like to put people on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Annual revenue, monthly revenue. Whatever you want to share. It's always so interesting to me to see which, which one people pick. Well, okay. Friends. I can I can answer both. That's fine. Um, <laughs> wow, <laughs> double header. She's an open book. <laughs> I'll say good friends. I have three good friends. More friends than three. Those three, <laughs> but three really good. I can count on friends. And then annual revenue is about three hundred thousand. Hell yeah, dude! That's three, three is the number. Yeah, that's a great number. <laughs> 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 that's amazing thanks for sharing that with us for your friends are they all from different parts of your life or are they like all childhood friends or all college friends they're all adult friends I didn't do well to make friends as a child rather I didn't do well to keep in touch I should say I was really bad at that admittedly I'm so bad at that too like period not just as a child <laughs> just it's in general hard. yeah <laughs> I'm so bad at it too. I'm I'm a very in the moment person and I struggle to always keep in touch with people when I move to different cities and or it, switch jobs or something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's not personal. It's, I like them. I just it's like, "Oh, wait, two years have gone by and I haven't said hi. Oops, sorry." But we were friends. <laughs> yeah, I still like you. Yeah, and I feel like social media complicates that even a little bit more because we feel maybe connected to someone because we see their life you know we witness their life but we're not talking to them and and we're like well I know I know that you got married but I haven't talked to you in five years is this a little awkward (laughs) so true we talk a lot about maintaining friends both 
professionally, but then also in your personal life. And as these are adult friends of yours, what is your rubric or your philosophy for friendships now that you have kind of established a new way of being in friendship? I, I really, I think we all, my friends, we all want to be seen and heard. So it's really like, I feel like as adults, we all bonded over the fact that we feel like we have to put on this brave face and act like we, uh, we're doing much better than we really are. And so I think we just agreed to just drop that and just be real. So not have to worry about being negative, not even work. If we have something good happen, it's like, let's, uh, let's celebrate it. Like be really unashamed about it <laughs> actually. And just, yeah, just be yourself. So. I'm stepping into that more and more. Yeah. I mean, you, you answered that transparency question about money so easily, you know, like it was nothing. So I can tell that you've had practice like owning the stuff that you're like that you fucking rock at. And that can, I think, is really hard as an entrepreneur. You were saying that you didn't have your financial shit together. And I'm like, you definitely had it way more together than I, I feel like your your idea of having your shit together is like. Or not not having it together <laughs> is like my having it together because you have a, a bachelor's in economics and you have your master's in accounting, right? So I feel like you've got you must just be so far ahead than the average person. I, I don't. Now I could probably say that, but then no, oh no, I knew how to be an accountant. Uh-huh. Right. I knew how to count to ten, but yeah. in terms of like the actual managing my money. I receive the paycheck, and next thing you know, it's just floating, like, it, it's gone. It's like a magic trick. So, yeah, I was I was definitely living that paycheck to paycheck and overdrawing my accounts pretty regularly as well. Mm-hmm. And what, so you said the turning point for you was then losing a source of income and kind of hitting rock bottom. What was that yeah. experience like for you to then kind of, switch things up what was the moment of kind of clarity or I'm sure there were several no there 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 was and and I actually appreciate you asking this question because I don't get a chance to share this often and I was so I was actually I moved in with my parents and I was like in denial for a whole year about what had happened just trying to get a job Starbucks wouldn't even hire me because they're like I'm too overqualified I went to another I tried to get a job at any fast food joint, no one would hire me. Like it was, <laughs> the economy where I was living wasn't that bad. So it took me opening, finally, I was living out of my suitcases because I refused to unpack. And it took me going through my suitcases. And it wasn't that I saw what I had necessarily, but I saw my accomplishments. I actually saw what, I never noticed what I had or what my experiences how good I'm doing. I never pat myself on the back. And I think that's very, we need to do that more often. So that was really the turning point for me where it's like, okay, I'm okay. And then it was like literally the next day a book fell into my lap. It was called Profit First. And that was the turning point, honestly. And I should say this at the time I was teaching yoga was the one that was, that employed me. I was teaching yoga classes and I started using Profit First using my yoga teaching money, which was not a lot, only $350 per month. Wow. And you Profit First did your way into where you are now. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Wow. That's amazing. We love Profit First here. (laughs) I think it works so well for squiggly brained people or people who have money anxiety or money trauma and Mm -hmm. don't, especially who don't trust themselves around money. And one thing that we talk about a lot with squiggly brains or ADHD is that you kind of need to like build this system around you to set you up for success and kind of keep you on the path. Right. And that means creating obstacles (laughs) where, where you might like easily fall down. I don't know, like into a spending habit, right. You have to make it harder for yourself not to spend and then make it easier to do the things that you don't want to do. Right. Like make it easier for yourself to put away your clothes by not having hangers or make it easier for yourself to save your money by putting yourself in an automated schedule. And profit first is just like almost made for someone with ADHD, I think. I love that you said that. It's because I know for a lot of people that I 
do work with or the people that talk around profit first, um, they get stuck at they look at the bank accounts that they have to open only. And I'd love to say, like, it's not about the bank accounts exactly. It's you're not really required to open all those bank accounts. You do it if you want to. But really, it's it's about, like you, like you said, the support, building a system, avoiding the pitfalls and and moving yourself forward. That's really what it's about. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so, I mean, actually, I do think the book Profit First is a little confusing. So maybe you can explain (laughs) it to people because if I wasn't so, I know I wouldn't have finished it if I didn't like (laughs) know that it was something that I desperately needed. And I'm also like a canon person. I love to read the full book (laughs) before I, but what if like, can you give someone the Cliff's Notes who maybe has been intimidated by Profit First and really wants to understand it? Sure. I'll actually start with how I got started because 350 versus my six figure salary, that was a big fall from grace for me. And uh, I got started for for about almost two years using Mr. McCallowitz calls it seeding the accounts. And that is taking 1% of your income and moving it to a savings account. So I, at the time I didn't have any scheduled anything. It wasn't every 10 days versus 25, none of that. I just, for me, anytime I received a check and it was easy at the time I got paid monthly, I would multiply 350 by 0.01 and move that $3 and 50 cents to my savings account. And that was before I spent my money on anything. And I overdrew my accounts for the first two months, (laughs) But that's okay. Nice thing about being a yoga teacher is I can always pick up classes and make up for it. But it was it was amazing how fast I had some money in my savings. Like it was when I work with people, they usually have nothing in their savings account. It's it's put money in and it goes back out. And for me it was like I move money to my savings and then on the third month, which is what I love, I get to treat myself and it's okay. <laughs> I could take up to 50% of what's in my account. So I was all for that. Just something that gave me permission to spend. It was easy enough to remember to move money over. And then I could do whatever I want with the other 99% of my money for the rest until I got paid again. And then, uh, so yeah, I would say that's, I would say that's the best way to start. You don't have to open six to 10 bank or five to 10 rather bank accounts. Just start with what you have. What do you think also about the method for specifically squiggly brained kind of intuitive people like you self identified really helped you with kind of the mindset around all of this? I had to. I, I think for me, the the mindset piece of it, we're not taught how to manage money when we're, I mean, very, very few people teach their kids how to manage money. We don't, we're not taught in our schools. So all I see online for me, and, and I think a lot of, whether well, squiggly brain, intuitive, squiggly brain, intu- I'm sorry, squiggly brain, introvert, that's what I meant to say, not intuitive, introvert, creative, all the labels, we were used to seeing how, what's what's going wrong? Don't spend on coffees. Don't do this. Don't do that. So I don't know. Maybe I was a, I was a rebel and I do it for my clients. <laughs> and I'm very much, it's not about the coffees. My first purchase was I want to challenge the coffee thing. So my first permission, my first draw was to buy a, a cup of coffee. And I did that every single time to prove to myself. And then eventually I share with clients to prove to them it's not the coffees, it's not the dinners. So I call it mindset and action. Sorry, that's a long-winded answer. But it's it's really you have to prove to yourself that give yourself permission. And if you – you can't mess it up. Let me put it that way. You know, if, you, if money is always coming in, you can't really mess up the system. So we have to get that whole I'm screwing up, I'm bad squiggly brain, I'm all know she's an introvert. All all those labels, no, let's toss it out the door. I mean the negative aspect of the labels. 
So that's the nice thing about Profit First. I think it's it helps with the positive. Being in why, it's beautiful to be squiggly. Yeah, I love that. One of the things that resonated with me about the method is that so many really successful business owners are not great at man- like learning that so many successful people are not great at managing money. And that doesn't mean that you're not an intuitive, creative business genius. It just means that you haven't been taught how to do something and you maybe have been avoiding it for a really long time. And I think that that can be a wound that a lot of squiggly brain people like, you know, the three of us have is that we're stupid or that we're lazy or that we don't have self-control. And we know we have evidence I think I can speak for all three of us that like, that's not true. <laughs> you know, we have evidence that all those things aren't true, but it it's almost like it doesn't compute that in some parts of my life, maybe it looks like I'm being lazy or it looks like I'm stupid or it looks like I, I don't care when I really or I'm being impulsive when that is so the opposite of who I am. And it can be really frustrating. And I love your mindset and action of just, it's almost like remembering who you are, you know, and practicing that. Absolutely. I, I really get frustrated with the negative connotations that, for example, if someone forgets to email one person uh, a schedule or, or forgets to dot an I, oh, they're creative, they're squiggly brained. Oh, that's because they're an introvert. And it's just like, what does that really mean? You know, so is, are you saying that the person is, you're, you're not human and the person is? So, yeah. Yeah, and I think to, to also your point about most people not being taught about money, I think there's a lot of assumptions about, like, who learns about money and who doesn't very often. And I think so much of it is fear-based in terms of why families still don't talk about it. And I think that's something that's still so pervasive that feels like, oh, well, you know, now – access to information about money is democratized so everyone can learn about it everyone knows about it but to your point again about being in action and what was the exact term you used sorry mindset in action and embodying these values and the self-talk that it requires that's a practice that develops over time and if you're not shown that over time it's very hard to learn it from even just a book or a course online and really embody it so I'm kind of I'm kind of curious about that transition for you about really embodying that mindset and then transitioning into the work that you're doing now and what kind of led you towards that. Yeah, the so I the embodiment I actually I was acting and I think that's a lot how a lot of us really are taught take action, take action, take action. And then I actually brought some of my yoga principles back into it where it's go within. And I realized I never stopped to think about what it is I truly want and need. To me, need and want tend to be the same thing. I don't want, I don't separate them anymore, but I never thought about what I wanted. It was always what I'm supposed to do. And it dawned on me that with all the, even with the accounting rules, like opening bank accounts, have savings, 401k, like all that stuff, many people, including myself, we we never stop and think, what's the money for? So after I got really my, my first cup of coffee, I had to take a, take a step back and I wrote, I like to write lists. So I wrote a list. I wrote down, what is it that I truly desire? What do I want? And at first, and that was hard, actually, because at first it was, I just want a cappuccino. (laughs) And then it expanded to where I want to travel, how much I want to earn, how I want to live. And then it became values, like what what do I stand for? What is it that I, why did I dislike this thing? Why do I like this thing? And I started to connect everything I wrote to what is in my bank accounts. And this is, this is probably the accountant in me, but I was able, I started to do that. And it kind of became like a journaling process, actually, where I could see where I was feeling happy, where I was feeling sad, where I made a decision, followed someone else's advice, but I didn't listen to my, my gut instincts, my intuition. 
So it became this dance. So that's me, of course, where it's like, okay, I made this a habit and a, a big, the next level of just like list, look at my accounts. Do they line up? Why or why not? I just started engaging with my money in that way. And I do bring that to, to actually my clients as well. When we first get started, it's the question of, okay, what's the money for? Why are you in business? And I'm amazed at how many business owners don't know their, I know the Simon Sinek thing, but their why, or really give themselves permission to say, this is what I want for my business. It's almost like they forget that they started their business because they wanted something better than working for somebody else. So we actually start there as well. That that's a that's the that can be all this the whole entire <laughs> work with them. I I like that idea of just getting clear on your internal compass and asking yourself, you know, and and something that I am obsessed with right now is this concept of how you spend your time reflects what your true priorities are versus mm-hmm. what you say your priorities are. And it sounds like you, you might have a similar perspective with money, right? Like how you decide to spend your money reflects how, or your energy, right? Reflects what your priorities are and what matters to you. So you might say, Oh, travel matters to me. But if you're not spending on that or putting anything towards saving towards the trip that you want to go to, that's not really that important to you, which is okay. It's just like, let's be transparent about what it is that we really want. Absolutely. I I think a lot of people just adding on to the want versus actually doing is a lot of people, it can be hard. It's scary. It's unsafe facing the judgment or what we, who we think will judge us. But at a certain point, we have to say, you know what, this is my life. Hopefully you're not trying to kill anybody, <laughs> but this is my life. I'm a decent person. And I, gotta, I have to do this for me so I can be, whether it's a better friend, a better parent, a, a better citizen. So, mm-hmm. Well, unhooking from those expect, societal expectations of what we should have or should want, right? Like, oh, we should get married or we should make six figures or we should buy a house, like, and really investigating whether those are truly things that we, we really want or they've just been ingrained in us because of society and expectations. I think that's really hard. Like that takes an undoing process all the time. And, and, and a, at least for me, I'll speak from the eye and like knowing myself and knowing when I'm on track versus off track. So for you, how do you know when you're sort of like off track from your, what we might call like sacred work, right? From your purpose. Like, how do you know when you're getting derailed or when you've been derailed? Is there a feeling or something that comes up for you? The the feeling is frustration. (laughs) I I've had to practice getting in touch with how I knew or how I know this, because even right now, the turnaround, my my mentioning the transparency question, I had to face that in 2020. And this might I'm going to just say this. It might sound controversial. I want to be clear. I'm not saying business coaching is bad. I'm not saying that. It's the business coaches that I had worked with. They didn't help me. And I got really stuck in this hole, but I'm supposed to quantum leap and business coaching is great and and all the the wonderful things that are told to us online. But I had to check and say, be a business owner for me. Mm -hmm. Take a look. What's starting to drain me in a very, very big way? And I had to see this big expense Mm -hmm. (laughs) on my financials and and be like, "It's, it's that. So it was, I told myself, I won't let it get so far. And when I say get so far, it was five and a half years of just copying from coach to coach to coach and not assessing because I took business coaching, working with a business coach as the best thing. And just to repeat, business coaching, I do believe in mentorship, by the way. It's Mm -hmm. just good mentors. So now whenever something feels off, I look into it. I, I, I coach myself and I say, okay, what's going on? I look at my numbers. That's That's been, I make sure I look at my numbers all the time and stop taking action blindly. So that's really cool. I, that's really been helpful. And yeah, I just really learned to trust myself. It took It took time, but it's now, it's like, it's okay. It's okay to trust myself. And I think kind of back to what we were just saying a little bit before, the 
the keeping up with the Joneses or the kind of just getting caught up in what people around you are doing, whether it's maybe working with a business coach and you think that's the thing, that's the key for me to get from point A to point B. It's really hard to even slow down as simple as it is. And we talk about this all the time in mindfulness and yoga and meditation. Like part of what we're just trying to is slow down to hear that voice that's trying to guide us or come through and speak to us about what we actually care about. And it sounds so simple, but I feel like with money, it becomes, you know, 10 times more complicated. And one of the things I know that you talked about when in our pitch was your controversial idea about how budgeting can be helpful for squiggly brained intuitives. And I was like, oh, I want to hear it. <laughs> So just just most people have a budget that doesn't fit them. And that's why budgets don't work for a lot of people. And I think about the last job I worked before I started working for myself, where the department, myself and department's head was come, come together. They're always blowing the budget, always. And they're like, it's too hard. And it's probably because it wasn't right for the company. So like... When I start to hear now in smaller business terms, like, oh, 35% of your revenue should go to owner's pay or, for example, 10% should go to savings or 20%, I always take a step back. And then I'm, I'm there, I have, there's different types of budget, but I always take a step back and say, what does that really mean? You know, that can mean a lot of things depending on, on whether it's your income, your, your hobbies. There's some people that if they could sleep in a tent all the time, <laughs> that's what they'll do. And they might need a different, they might need something different versus the person that wants to live in a high rise. That's $5,000 or $10,000 per month. I mean, it's, there's just different needs. So I think the first thing when it comes to the right budget, even for squiggly brain, before any budget comes into play, I believe I'm going back to that writing down what you want, or maybe you like to talk it out or, or type it out, but get clear as you can what it is that you want. Make that list. It's almost like sounding like manifesting, but it is. Write that list of, of the things that you want and like, and I'm sure you start to see patterns. And then go to your current, take a look at your, your, your money, your accounts. And this is a matter of like, getting connected with whether it's moving you towards all you want or moving you away and then begin to see, okay, what are the limits? What are this or that? Profit first is a great budget, by the way. It's not the traditional ones, but that's, that's why I love profit first. I love, here's the bulk, bulk of money I can use. I can do with it what I will. That's what I liked about profit first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like, I like about profit first that it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, it really does play on that, which can be a weakness, would feel like a weakness for a lot of us. If we can't see something, it doesn't exist because of object impermanence. But when you can't see that money, you can't spend it. So that's a great way to trick yourself into saving or to investing in your future because it, because money is also such an abstract concept for so many people. It's both extremely like visceral and real and scary and traumatizing, but also like it's this fake thing. And, and especially for people with ADHD, we have a really hard time picturing the future. We just can't really see it. And I imagine as an accountant and as someone who thinks and talks a lot about mindfulness, bridging those two things for your clients or, you know, the people that you work with who are nervous around money or have money trauma can be really difficult. So what advice might you give someone who's, who knows that they quote unquote should be saving or should be investing in their 401k or should have a 401k or whatever, who's freaking out right now. Cause they're like, how do I even set that up? How do you help them slow down and envision their future in a way that doesn't feel scary and like they're failing towards it? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So the nice thing is when someone is working with me, that's help. That's that support that, and I know not everybody can, whether it's a Ford or I don't like to always use that word, but it's true. It's it's working with, with assistance. A human assistance can be out of one's price range. It was out of mind for a while too. And so if you have a human assistant, that person should be 
that person is really not to shame you. That person can now be like whatever is your, and I quote, shortcomings, that person is supposed to be strong in that area. So if the person right away, that's, that should start to bring that, that stress and anxiety that down, like calm the nervous system. Secondly, I'm all about speaking of mindfulness. I mean, if, if one likes, we can't forget to take care of ourselves. So I do ask questions like if the person likes yoga or if the person likes to walk in nature, I'm, I found a breath work coach that was on a happy accident, but I'm glad I did. Someone that's t- telling me to take at least five minutes a day for myself, just get quiet and listen to my breath. And that does wonders in terms of just slowing someone down. So I share some of that. I think the advantage of my background with the, with yoga and, and numbers kind of is it's helpful. But yeah, the person when you have a human resource, a human support, like they are they're there for you. So just that in itself is can be helpful. Um, yeah, not to feel like you're alone. I think sometimes yeah. part of that like spiral for people is feeling like oh, I'm bad, I'm the only one like this, Mm -hmm. I'm alone, I'm to blame. And it's helpful to get out of that space to be able to bounce those things off of somebody else and feel seen and heard and recognized. Yeah, I always tell myself in the history of money, I'm not the worst at it. (laughs) There's always going to be someone who's who's worse than me. It's going to be okay. They're absolutely going to have seen worse. And like, this is fixable because all problems really are fixable in some way. And sometimes you can't see the answer, but somebody else can. And you can't move forward until you start trying chipping away at that solve, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm a huge fan of get support. If it's human support, a book is a good start. Podcasts are fantastic. Maybe it's not even that technical. Just go walk, like clear your head in any way you can. So, yeah, support yourself, get plenty of sleep, Mm -hmm. (laughs) drink water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Speaking of tools, one of the things we love to talk about on this podcast are, well, and in general, are tools that we are trying that we're loving, whether it's an app, a new calendar, a new device, could be a notebook, anything that you feel like right now you're just kind of geeking out on that improves your life by tenfold. Oh, I'm boring with this one. I think for me, I geek out on the fact that I can, that I try and use what I have just because I feel like people feel like they have to get all these extra things. And it's like, when it comes to money, it's so stressful already. Let's use what you have. You have a phone. Yeah. Most of us have some kind of spreadsheet depending on this computer system. I do advise getting some kind of online accounting software. Work with what we have and keep it simple. And then build on top of that. So, yeah, I'm boring. <laughs> no, there there are no wrong answers here. Yeah, and those are the classics. You know, like QuickBooks works. Yeah. Quick, you know, it's like doesn't have to be fancy. It just works. Whatever works. Yeah. Love yep. that. Very sustainable <laughs> answer. I think we're almost done. I don't want to take you too far over. I know we started a little bit late, but my question my question for you would be like, what's what's other than profit first? Like what is canon for for you in terms of like great reads or books or even like teachers who you think everyone needs to know about when it comes to mindfulness and money? and maybe having a squiggly brain. Hmm. Trying to pair it with one. I'm actually revisiting the science of getting rich right oh, now. Oh, nice. I've never read and that And I'm amazed either. at how different I see this book. I think the first time I read it, it was like, I didn't understand any of it, actually. And then now I, I read it, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, this author, I almost feel like he, even though it was the 1930s, he's kind of still calling some people out today, but in a good way. Maybe also calling in. 
And so what I'm referring to was I, I took it from him as this, keep it simple. It's like, you don't need any rituals or potions or anything to, to bring in money to like, it's coming. If you want it, it's there for you. And I'm like, I love that. Like, I don't need to do anything extra. Okay. Keep it simple. So yeah, that's the one that I, that's been top of mind for me right now. Sci- the science of getting rich. Oh, but, I'm going um, to have to check that book out because I've never read it. Who wrote it? Wallace D. Waddles. Oh, wait. Wallace. No, I do remember <laughs> that. Oh, yeah. I was going to say, was that him? I remember, actually, I heard about him from, oh, no, I'm forgetting her name. She got quite famous. She has a coaching program called, hold on, let me look it up one sec. <laughs> Anyways, we'll find it. Yes, <laughs> we'll link it. But that's that's cool to know. So in terms of keeping it simple, it's coming. Last follow up question on this. How do you see that for you in your life? Like, how do you embody that mindset or take action on that mindset? So maybe there are things that mm. you don't do as a result. In terms of keeping it simple, I always have to question if I'm complicating things because I can do that. I have an example with my, my, my heart centered breathwork coach. He asked for a photo evidence of me, just evidence of me taking moments of silence and that's it. And yeah, no, it's wonderful. And you know what I did? I'm here looking for the sunset and, and making sure the camera's turned a certain way. I'm You're editing like making a with, matcha, with color You're adding filters. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, what am I doing? Because now this has become an hour exercise instead of a brief moment of silence. So I always have to ask, check in with myself. Am I keeping this simple? Okay. Just send the photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. That is very good. And a good reminder. I also think with books like that that can feel or like advice like that of like just know that it's coming it can feel infuriating at least it felt infuriating for me when I was like but I don't have any money (laughs) like I don't know it's coming but when you read maybe when you're not in that place anymore and you go back and you read stuff like that you understand that when you really are committed like to that shift or that change you start to see solutions in places that you hadn't seen them before. You start to like think of, oh, this, this would be a good way for me to make some more money or, oh, this is a potential opportunity or, you know what, I should actually like follow up with that person. And it's so subtle and you couldn't really teach it to someone, I don't think explicitly. It wouldn't land in the same way, but, and it feels, again, so frustrating when, when you are not in that headspace. But when you go back, at least that's how books like that always kind of like land with me now that I'm in a really different place in my life. Yeah, yeah, I, you said it perfectly, actually, (laughs) it's like, in the moment, it's like, what? And then through growth and evolution, happened to revisit it, and it's like, oh, okay, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it's like you, you start to, like, rip open these, these holes in the universe or portals, right, to, like, that are, that end up being those quantum leaps, where instead you were just waiting for, to, like, stumble upon them, it's, and and then you start to make them happen. But it's not like hustle culture and it's not forcing. It's just like, oh, duh, of course this is the next step. Of course, if like I want to feel financially abundant, this is something that I would do. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is so antithetical to the society that we live in that is always pushing for more and more more productivity, productivity. And I think also with financial tools or products that are out there there's also always a push to you know you need these five apps and to your point about keeping it simple I think so often it's like well maybe doing less touching less (laughs) spending less more time to myself sitting with myself listening to myself allowing space to open up for things to come through is feels antithetical but is actually the solution 100 mm-hmm. percent. i actually have to say i love what you just said because i find that 
we as a society, we've created all these options and sometimes it can lead to analysis paralysis, but it gives room to the mindfulness and, and you said it just right. Like it's, it's the, now we get to, because we have choice, we get to think, do we need this? Do we want this? And the things aren't as scarce anymore. It's just now stepping more into it and, and being okay with slowing down to really process and make sure that a decision or in the form of a tool or, or what have you or silence is the right decision. Reminds me of good for you. We talk about it over there. You know, what our other podcasts were always asking, like, okay, to be capitalism critical, that means we have to be critical of what we think we want, right? Like, why do I think I want this thing? And so often it's just sort of projected onto us. Well, of course you want this thing. That's why we're marketing it to you. But we really slow down. We're like, I don't think I need another purple lip gloss. Like, I'm good. I have one. (laughs) Well, our last question for you, I know I've said that a couple of times already, but really this is going to be the last question, um, <laughs> is it's a good one and it has to do with the future. What would future you whisper into current you's ear? Nice work. <laughs> yes, I love that. <laughs> love that encouragement. We all need that more. Yeah. I'm in a spicy space, so it's like she'll say nice work. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. And oh, how can people work with you, find more out about you, follow along with your journey at the Mindful Bookkeeper? What what can we let our community know about all of your work? Sure. I, I actually have... I guess a taste of me, a lead magnet that's called 11 ways to grow your bank account without selling more. Speaking of keeping things simple, it's actually technically 12 ways, but speaking of keeping things simple, it's just, it's kind of a really stop, reflect and check in with what you currently have. Can you actually have more money without going out and perhaps expending more energy? So that's one way. I I do have a podcast myself. It's called Cheers to Your Prosperity. So that's more talking of me, reminding us that we all have a right to prosper <laughs> financially. And uh, yes, my uh, should I give one one more thing? I am on the gram, Mindful Ichiyama, <laughs> and of course my website. So we can pick many options. This I gave four things. But please pick one. <laughs> pick the, the one that calls you right now. Perfect. We'll put all of those links into the show notes so people can find you and in, of course, our email. If you're not already subscribed to our email list, what what are you doing? Get on it. Like you get all this stuff. It's 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 amazing. <laughs> I like your email list actually. <laughs> Thank ah, you. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> I read them. I read every single one. So, ah, <laughs> oh, thank you. I was, I was, you know, talking to the rogue listener out there who maybe wasn't on our email list. <laughs> <laughs> this was so lovely. Thank you so much for also reaching out and pitching us. We saw your message and we were like, hell yeah, yeah. this is such a good oh, thing. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that feedback. Thank you so much. Of course, this was so great. Thanks for spending the time with us. We hope you enjoyed the episode. The rest of the month, we're going to be talking to several different professionals, creators, and very interesting people about different aspects of money, whether it relates to their business or their personal life. And we're so excited to introduce you to those people. And we're also giving away a little prize this month if you submit a review. Reviews really help us get found and share this information with more people. So if you submit a review, you will be entered to win the four-day energetic recalibration. We created it for equinoxes, autumnal equinoxes, and the summer equinox, spring equinox, because you're at this turning point or you're at this moment where you can take a pause, can take a breath, can kind of like see where the dust is settled and potentially take stop, recalibrate your energy and decide what direction you want to move in next. And I think this is a great time to do that as we are closing up this end of the year before the holiday season, before 
everything sort of your plans all sort of like go up in the air, getting your mind organized around what you want 2023 to be, who you want to be, and maybe what you want to call in. And it's one of our best selling classes. So if you want to win access to it, go ahead and write a sparkling review on Apple Podcasts and we will announce our winner at the end of the month. We'll see you next week. Thank you for listening. Love you. Bye.